Welcome to Unpacking Armenian Studies. This is a podcast series of the University of Southern California Institute of Armenian Studies. We are inviting you to a limited series that we are calling Ukraine, Armenia, and War. In the six, six episodes that we've already posted, I've spoken about the humanitarian, the political situations as they've evolved, as seen in Ukraine and Poland with Armenia's ambassadors to those two countries, as well as the view from Armenia and Georgia. Today, we're going to be speaking about the economic and monetary impact of this war on third countries and Armenia specifically. We know that for Europe, for example, the economic consequences are driven by the impact of the war on the energy sector, supply limitations, price hikes, and also on general public confidence, of course, and the impact of that on economic growth or non-growth. But what about Armenia and the Caucasus? And to help us understand the economic and monetary, maybe seismic consequences uh, for Armenia, consequences that are both dangers and in some cases possibly opportunities, I've uh, invited as my guest today, Varujan Avedikyan, who is managing partner at TKN Partners legal and advisory firm in Yerevan. Prior to that, Mr. Avedikian was general counsel of the Central Bank of Armenia for 12 years, where he spearheaded reforms and authored legislation for Armenia's financial sector. He also teaches at the American University of Armenia and the French University in Armenia. Varujan Avedikian, welcome. Thank you, Sophie, for the kind introduction and for um, initiating this series. Well, I really, really think that, you know, as with many other things, we're not looking at this from this very specific prism, though the international press is drowning in really good articles about the rest of the issues. But what about the impact of the war on, on Armenia? And before we start with the financial sector, which is an area you know really well, Tell us what a non-specialist would see today in Yerevan. You know, what visible economic and social consequences are there? Uh, we spoke about this a little bit in our first episode uh, with Garen Harutunyan, who was editor in chief of CivilNet. But you know, our first episode was a week ago. That's a whole lifetime already. What's happening? Yeah, um, so if, if you go to downtown Yerevan right now, you can see that um, you can see a lot of Russians and not only Russians, but Belarusians and some Ukrainians, uh, but mostly Russians. Um, and since you asked about the financial sector or the banking sector, we see a lot of a lot of these people um, uh, wanting to open bank accounts in Armenia, which brings a uh, um, some challenges to the Armenian banks, banking sector, also to them as well, because these people, um, they're, they're, because of the sanctions uh, on financial transactions, uh, and um, these people are basically, they cannot use their uh, credit cards or bank accounts, so they need to have some kind of uh, uh, banking services um, to pay for the for the day, for their daily needs. And this is about this is about the, the, the ordinary people um, in Yerevan who have fled uh, Russia or Belarus. Um, so there is a, a heightened demand. And if you walk into the branches, bank branches right now, especially in downtown Yerevan, um, I was talking to, to a branch manager the other day, one of the banks, she told me that uh, for the past 10 years, uh, 10, 10 days, she hasn't served any Armenians. She's serving only Russian citizens. Um, That's how intense is, the demand is. Oh, 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 yeah, of course. And as a as a law firm as well, we we're seeing this hike in demand. But I want to concentrate on the on the um, on one of the issues that is not very often spoken about, which is uh, foreign companies, um, U.S. European companies having branch offices uh, or subsidiaries in Russia bringing their employees over to Armenia because they want to continue their work, right? It's especially in the tech sector, it's, it's very expensive. So if a firm, let's say if a, a US company that has offices in Russia and let's say they have 
300 or 400 people, it's very, very challenging to lose them, especially if it's a tech company, because these people are involved in projects. Most probably they have a lot of contracts that they have to, and timelines that they have to accomplish. So we're seeing a lot of uh, migration to Armenia with whole staffs who want to establish themselves here in Armenia and continue their work, right? Um, so and, this um, does not yeah. in any way uh, impact Armenia's political standing vis-a-vis -vis the sanctions? Well, that's a, that's a tough question because from the banking perspective, uh, of course, because the banks, the Armenian banks have to make sure that they, uh, they work in compliance with, with the sanctions because uh, the financial world especially is very interconnected, right? And so the banks, they also have to make sure that the customers that they're coming there, they're receiving the Russian citizens are, or, the, or, the, or the companies that are moving to Armenia or relocating to Armenia, so to say, they, they, they're, they're not, they do not fall within the sanctions and they're ordinary companies trying to make a living and to trying to uh, pay their employees, you know, the payrolls, etc. So this is, this is challenging because the Armenian banks have to make sure uh, to, to serve these customers on one hand, but to also, um, also make sure that they themselves comply to, the, comply to the regulations and they know who their customers is. I Another think, thing, which is, yeah, yeah. I, ahead, I think before you move on, it's worth explaining why Armenia needs to comply. What happens if an yeah. Armenian bank does not comply intentionally or unintentionally? Yes, that's, that's an excellent question. And maybe few people know about this, but Armenia having a relatively smaller bank or, but very healthy banking sector, but relatively small. Um, they're connected, the Armenian banks are connected to, to the outside world with their corresponding banks. So any international transfers, they have to have happen uh, through corresponding banks. And I, I can tell you that only two Armenian banks, they have direct uh, corresponding accounts with US banks, only two out of 17. Um, and um, again, very few of them, they have uh, direct corresponding relations with with European banks, so they want they they need to make sure that they do comply with this uh, with these limitations, just not to lose their corresponding relations with their corresponding U.S. or European banks. Which, because if Armenia, yeah, if Armenian banks lose this, then Armenia will become or the Armenian financial system and the economy consequently will, will become isolated from the world. Uh, financial uh, from the world's financial kind of uh, network, right? Which means that whether it's remittances or payments or donations or any sort yes. of money from the outside in and from the inside out yes. won't get there because the correspondent bank in the middle is not yes. willing to or able to deal with Armenia. Yes, so so um, figuratively saying that the, the sanctions that are on Russian banks or on Russian um, companies or individuals will have a sort of a spillover effect on Armenian banks if Armenian banks do not comply with those with those limitations. So uh, the, the the local banks have to pay uh, play a very uh, they have to walk the razor's edge basically, I believe, to make sure that they both serve and they comply. There are Russian-owned banks in Armenia, right? Yes, some of them there are. And um, so we have, yeah. Th they continue to function? Well, um, that's, that's, um, that's a good question. We have one Russian bank, which is directly owned by, uh, the, by the Russian BTB bank. It's called BTB Armenia. It is a 100% BTB-owned uh, bank. And since BTB bank is under sanctions, um, the local VTB is also suffering. Uh, I know, uh, and this is from personal kind of, uh, um, I know people who had uh, VTB bank cards and they couldn't make any payments with those cards uh, until the bank finds a solution uh, to make sure that it serves its clients, at least internally within Armenia, because people, they have deposits and these are ordinary people, right? People, they have deposits, people, they have their cards, people, they make their payments and, Ordinary people cannot suffer 
uh, due to the to, due to the sanctions on 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 Russian banks. So I know that the central bank and VTB Bank itself, the local VTB Bank, are are working to make sure that in the coming few days, uh, at least um, the transactions are. Uh, can take place at least in Armenia locally with uh, with, with with payments and uh, payment cards. Yeah. And these difficulties that you just mentioned are difficulties that ordinary Armenians are having with their VTB Armenia bank account. Yes, We're not talking yes, about yes, I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, what, I know, I know, I know, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, I just, there's just so much to cover. I, I'm going to be, I'm going to keep interrupting you and I'll apologize now. Um, of course, of course. The, the uh, the situation of uh, Russians and others who, when they left Russia, had credit cards in their pockets, and by the time they got to Armenia, found that those credit cards are frozen. How do they function? Mm -hmm. How do they open uh, bank accounts, knowing that they have assets somewhere? Yeah, so um, so a couple of years ago, uh, Russia introduced, well, before that, I think it was 2015 or 16, um, <clears throat> I don't remember very well, but Russia introduced its own local payment system. Uh, by the way, Armenia had its own since 2000, 2001, I believe, uh, our, the ARCA system, the Armenian card. Uh, and, like and Armenia, by that, Russia but let me explain or try to understand both. The ARCA card is equal, for example, in the United States to the, what is it, the ACH system? The No, where... it's, it's like Visa or MasterCard, right? It's a, it's a processing okay. system. It's a local company. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, the, the company was, was established by the central bank and the local banks with some uh, USAID uh, assistance back in 2000s. And Armenia back in 2000, uh, 2000 uh, was clever enough uh, to establish its own local system because we were not connected to Visa or MasterCard. Um, so we set up our own system and later on, uh, this system, the ARCA system, which is an infrastructure company, uh, became member of Visa and uh, MasterCard, which are the international, major inter inter international about, um, sort of card or payment processing companies, right? Um, but Russia didn't have this until 2015. And I'll tell you something uh, that uh, I think in 2014 or 15, uh, President Putin, uh, asked uh, President Sargisyan, the then president of the, of, the, of the country, to help the to help Russia to establish a local system, and we did. Uh, so Armenians they they did help Russia, and they uh, they advised on how to set up their own local card or payment processing system, which is called Mir. Okay, and after that, Mir was served in Armenia. So those Russians who have Mir card. They they could use uh, their cards for payments uh, oh, by I most see. of the banks. Okay, oh, I see. so but not everyone in Russia had mid-career cards because many many Russians they depended on Visa cards or Master cards, um, which are which basically pulled out of Russia, right? Or not, they're not serving right. Russian customers. So it created challenges for them. But <clears throat> so that's why many of the Russians who are coming to Armenia to settle themselves here. Um, they're, they're, they, they have this um, need to have local, local currency, I mean, arts to make sure that they can pay for their everyday needs, right? Right, right. Um, let's stick to financial services for a few more minutes. Um, I suppose insurance falls within this and isn't the largest insurance company in Armenia Russian owned? Um, no, the, no, no, the, 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 our insurance companies are local, are very local, although one of the insurance companies has the word Ross, but it's, 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 a, it's locally owned. Ross so the insurance is completely local. Yes, yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's Armenian, it's a local Armenian company. So insurance is, is not that much uh, impacted, let's say, but the financial services definitely are, or the banking services. And uh, if we go into the monetary stability issues that are mm -hmm. that, you know tied again to the financial services, can we talk both about inflation and uh, about uh, the value of the dirham and what central bank is doing and why? Yeah, 
So, um, so what we see is an increase of demand in Armenia towards U.S. dollars because um, I'm guessing uh, many many Russians who are coming here they're also demanding uh, to you know sort of they're they're putting a demand on U.S. dollars because they want to exchange their rubles to U.S. dollars and we can see this demand. Uh, so that's why we can see that. For the past couple of days, after the after the, uh, the the military conflict started in Ukraine, uh, we're seeing a hike from approximately 480 drams per dollar to uh, to almost uh, 510 um, uh, per dollar. So we're seeing this uh, rise in demand and thus the rise of the exchange rate, which will definitely create some inflationary pressures, pressures here in Armenia because Armenia, our, the Armenian economy depends a lot on, on imports, right? And imports are, are facilitated basically uh, by dollars. Um, so we can, we, we, we're already seeing uh, some hikes in prices uh, in commodities and um, this is definitely creating inflationary pressures um, for the for the Armenian economy, and that's one of the reasons why I guess the central bank increased the uh, increased the refinancing rate lately. Is there is it too early to uh, see what kind of drop I'm imagining drop there is and will be in remittances? you know, paychecks sent back home from Russia? Because on the one hand, that even short-term uh, rise in the, the value of the, the Turam uh, can work for local residents, right? But that means the remittances still have to be coming. Are they? Is it too early to tell? Um, it's, it's too early because the remittances are, uh, are seasonal, right? Uh, because main, the, the, main, the main bulk of remittances they do come from Russia, and we're seeing two things here: the shutdown of, of the of Russian financial system, okay, due to the sanctions, and second, the shutdown of airway uh, Russian um, Russian flights or Russian originating flights like Aeroflot, right? Mm -hmm. Because many of these people they used to come and bring in the cash or send in the cash to their relatives to Armenia. So we're definitely seeing a drop. Uh, we'll, and we'll be seeing the dro a, a drop in remittances, um, and which would also negatively impact the uh, the impact the Armenian economy in the short term, at least. You mentioned imports a minute ago. Can we talk about the impact already being seen or projected, especially when it comes to food security? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, so let's let's talk about imports and exports uh, here because Armenia is Armenian economy is dependent on imports and uh, especially energy products. Uh, that's a big uh, big factor uh, within the within the import imported goods and as well as um, local production. So any hike in energy prices uh, has a spillover effect on on. Uh, on local inflation. So we were seeing this and I think we'll be seeing this, but also exports because um, our Russia uh, it was the main, still is the main uh, trading partner with Armenia. And um, which means that many Armenian local producers, especially for agricultural products, <clears throat> they were exporting mainly to Russia. Uh, a big sector, agriculture, uh, is, a, is, a, is a huge sector in Armenia, especially for fresh fruits, uh, vegetables, uh, mm -hmm. fisheries, uh, meat products uh, sometimes, um, so or processed foods as well. Uh, so we're seeing here challenges both for exports and for and for payments. Um, th this is challenging, and uh, uh, I, I believe the government has to figure out a way to assist uh, producers. Uh, who were exporting, um, they have to figure out a way to assist these producers, exporting pr producers, uh, to make sure that they stay afloat during these tough times because we're talking about jobs here, right? 
uh, the, the local producers, especially in the food industry, food, uh, food uh, processing industry, they, they provide a lot of jobs in the economy. So we need to make sure that, the, that these jobs are kept and these producers uh, are helped uh, to make sure that um, they stay afloat during these uh, tough times. And in terms of any sort of food related imports, including wheat, for example, yeah, um, wheat, that's another challenge because due to the uh, 44 days war, because some of the wheat to Armenia was coming, uh, we're seeing a shortage uh, in wheat all over the world. And our, Armenia is also part of it, although the government has been assuring that we have enough strategic reserves. Um, I'm not sure. Um, uh, because For a those year reserves, is what I had heard, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure how long. Uh, or how much of the reserves are there because those are uh, this is that information is not public I believe but although they're ensuring that we have enough reserves but I also have to mention the food we were import uh, the, or the wheat products that we were importing from uh, southern Artsakh and due to the war uh, the 44 days war uh, of, of um, that we had uh, in 2020 uh we we have been experiencing shortages uh of, of wheat as well so that's another challenge we're we're facing all right um does armenia did armenia does armenia import directly from ukraine i'm not sure about that so i don't want to speculate but okay. we certainly imported from russia mm -hmm. from russia and Artsakh and some local production as well, but that's not significant. So um, two areas. One is energy, of course, and energy is a part of a, a bigger topic, which is the major economic sectors where Russia is either a large investor or owner or the sole investor or owner. And this is true for many uh, infrastructure areas. It's certainly true for mining in Armenia. Um, let's talk about both of those. Let's start with energy. Is there, um, is there immediate concern about energy security, gas provisions? Yeah, yes, of course, Ben. That's not only true for Armenia, but the whole world. Armenia is, being, is, is part of it, especially in the case that Russia has almost a uh, monopoly uh, on the... On the um, Almost a monopoly on the energy sector and uh, and, the, uh, and the energy production uh, in this country, especially with uh, uh, Gazprom uh, is owned by 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 by, uh, by the Russian company here that bring that imports the, the, the gas, which is a, which which is in, which plays an important which is an important resource resource for the local uh, local both for the local production and for heating the homes. Um, so. Uh, that's that that's a, that's that's a, that's a challenge, uh, Salfi. Um, is and, challenge uh, the polite word, or are we really in deep trouble? How how? Um, I think. Well, it's hard to say because these discussions with the with the Russian government are not very transparent, unfortunately. Uh, so we don't we don't know much what's happening. What's the negotiate? There was an increase in in prices lately. Uh, Even and prior from, to this uh, from point. April, yeah, yeah, from first uh, of April, I believe, uh, and uh, we'll we'll feel this, uh, and because negotiated started long before this, so there will be an increase, but it, it, it happened before the, this war, uh, so I'm, I'm not sure if we'll we'll see further increases uh, in the country. After we talk about these other economic sectors, I also want to ask about Georgia because, in some ways. In some ways, they too are impacted in some of the same ways. Um, uh -huh. And of course they are being, being the energy transit point. Anyway, back to that in a minute. But um, what about the other sectors, economic sectors where Russia is a big player in Armenia? So um, my, my major concern, uh, since I, I do a lot of work with, with local businesses, my major concern is uh, exports. So I, I primarily focus on exports uh, to, especially for, for companies who export uh, to Russia. 
as well as uh, some those companies who imported or exported uh, products or technology, especially with technology imports using the Black Sea. I know that many, many importers are facing trouble for importing via the Black Sea because some insurance, European insurance companies, they're not covering um, sea cargo if they're passing through the Black Sea. This is, this is uh, an information that is out there. So um, we'll see transact, we're, we're seeing transaction costs adding up and uh, that those will definitely affect um, local uh, goods and services, right? The prices of local goods and services. Um, yeah. And uh, there are so many folds to this and the, uh, the areas where there is no uh, transport involved, but for example, but where you know, financial uh, investment needs to continue to happen, for example, in the mining sector. Mm -hmm. Well, mining, mining is, a, is an interesting, uh, <coughs> interesting sector with many respects. Uh, you know that the, uh, lately the uh, uh, civil net did, a, did an investigation on this and I think they're in a loss. Uh, because, because uh, information was not given to them. Um, lately, there was a transaction with the Zangezur uh, mine, right? Uh -huh. With the Russian, what Russian entities acquiring, and um, again, not being transaction, not being very transparent here. I know that some uh, media outlets are in lawsuits with the government, demanding information to be transparent regarding this. Uh, so. In some mining companies, the, uh, the, there is a Russian presence, but there is also this uncertainty, I believe, caused due to, uh, uh, caused due to the Lydian case a couple of years ago, uh, starting from 2008, you know, with the Lydian case and um, this new, um, I, I, don't, I can't say policy, but approach of not encouraging mining as a, as a, as a as a sector in the country, uh, due to the concerns uh, regarding the Amulsar project, etc. Lydian uh, being the mining company that uh, Lydia, that ha was going to operate the Amulsar mine, the gold mine. And because this is not a Russian company, but this is not a Russian company. Yeah. So due to this crisis, generally the the involvement of the mining uh, mining sector uh, in the economy has decreased. Uh, well, Russia's inability, or at least temporary inability, to uh, continue to invest seriously is not as consequential right now. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, we have more serious consequences of the of the of losing mines in Artsakh due to the war um, and um, there are some private transactions that I know which I cannot publicly speak about that have due to the private sort of issues that they've yes. uh, uh, that they have lost business but I'm not sure if due to this conflict um, the Armenian mining industry will suffer because it has already suffered due to the Lydian case due to the Artsakh war and some issues within the mining industry itself. Plus, mining industry doesn't need so much investment per se, uh, as such as the other companies. But Safi, since our time is limited, I wanted to focus on, because we spoke about challenges a lot, but I want to sp speak about, if you, if you have time, of course. Of course, a for little opportunities, bit. definitely. But for but opportunities, I want, to, I want to focus on this because- definitely. But wait, uh, before you go there, yeah, yeah. what about telecom? Yeah. Well, telecom is a, <laughs> is a tough place. Um, so we have three telecom companies. One is, uh, one is local. The other one is uh, a Russian company, MTS, which is also listed on the- in the United States, it's a listed company. Uh, oh, and the other, yeah, yeah. And the other one is also, no, I, I think we, and two, two locals and one Russian, two locals and one Russian. Plus we have the, the cable uh, network, 
uh, Ros Telecom, which is indirectly owned by indirectly owned by Ros Telecom. So that there's another so, uh, affected sector over affected there. or potentially affected. Potentially, potentially affected. I haven't. I haven't done a uh, deep research on what's happening, uh, but I'm sure it's, you know, it, it, they're going to take some hit, I believe. By, by hit, does that mean a financial uh, problem uh, for the companies? It, or does it mean uh, limitations think, of services for the Armenian public? I don't think there will be limitation of services for the Armenian public, uh, but... Um, uh, due to uh, due to one of the telecom companies be having presence, I don't know what they're doing. I'm, I haven't investigated. I haven't done any research there, but they might face some problems, and hopefully they can handle those. But not uh, so. I'm not. It's too early for me to say how it would affect them. But the other two companies that the, the mobile operators are locally owned. All right. Is there anything you want to say or can say about? impact on Georgia, not specifically necessarily just on Georgia, but also how that will then affect um, Georgia, Armenia, like uh, during the 2008 war, for example, when the direct link between Georgia and Russia was closed, Armenia uh, was impacted because of additional uh, airlines and flights and, and all of that. Is there any sort of Georgia connection you can make and then opportunities? So um, what we're seeing now, uh, of course, the, the Lars corridor is all, all, always, a, always a challenge uh, due to geo both geopolitical issues and, uh, and the climate issues, et cetera. It's always a challenge. You know? So the Lars it's, corridor uh, is the, the corridor that, connect, that is the landline between uh, Georgia and Russia. And Russia, and that's where we get the uh, where road uh, road um, sort of transport right. from Russia to 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 Yerevan or to Armenia. Uh, it's always a challenge, no no matter if there's war or not. But um, I'd like to uh, uh, for the past couple of days, I'm getting requests as a lawyer from from um, companies who have settled down in Georgia and they have a keen interest of relocating from Georgia to Armenia and. This makes me happy, actually, in many ways, uh, personally. Um, I hear that, um, and this this is again very superficial on very superficial level, of course. But I'm I'm, I'm getting real requests. Um, some of these uh, companies who have, uh, or employees or staff who have gone to Georgia, they're not they're not very feeling very comfortable uh, because the Georgians. Um, primarily are backing the Ukrainian government, etc., and they have sympathies towards Ukraine. And uh, there is general anti-Russian, very general, again, very subjective, anti-Russian kind of a rhetoric in some of the some of the um, groups in in Georgia. So we're seeing um, greater interest from those who have moved to Georgia due to the war to relocate to Armenia. And um, currently, I'm working with a couple of companies who who want to relocate their staff uh, from Georgia to Armenia. So we're seeing this. And can Armenia use this opportunity? I think it certainly should. And what other opportunities? So one important opportunity that uh, I want to focus on, because there might be a number of opportunities, but one important opportunity is the human capital fact that I want to focus on, especially with the, with the tech industry and the expertise in the tech industry. Russians, uh, at least those people who were involved uh, in the tech industry in Russia, they're highly skilled and highly demanded. And we're seeing a lot of, a lot of those uh, people coming to Armenia. Now, the challenge or the opportunity rather for, for Armenia tech companies is to is both to hide uh, hire them or to incorporate these teams within their local teams and go to the world and approach the world uh, with a with a Russian Armenian kind of a mixture team um, and that that's a, that's an important opportunity for Armenia to really change the fabric 
uh, of corporate teams, especially again for the IT or te the tech sector, and to come with bigger projects, more ambitious projects to outside partners. Um, and that will also create the, the required, I believe, again, this is very subjective, my own opinion, the required um, diversity that the Armenian tech industry needed uh, for so many years, because there is always the, this need in, in, the, in Armenia that we need more people for, for the tech industry, we need more IT people, more engineers, more te uh, technology experts, etc. So here they are, can we keep them or not? Because Unfortunately, uh, Armenia was not good in keeping the, the Syrian Armenians who fled Syria after the Syrian war, or many of the Lebanese Armenians who came here, where we saw that they um, sort of, they re-migrated to other countries. Um, so will we be able to keep them here, to keep them here and change our fabric? Uh, that's... That's that's a question I ask. Uh, I discuss these matters, and that's that's a great opportunity, I believe. Well, if this conversation has to end, that's as good a place as any, I suppose. Um, Varjan Avedikian, you've opened up all sorts of windows into this quickly, continuingly, continuously changing uh, scenario in Armenia, and not just Armenia. I suspect we will have other conversations about this as well. I really, really thank you. Thank you, Salpi. Thank you so much for the very interesting questions. I really enjoyed this discussion and oh. ho hopefully it was helpful to your um, um, audience. I suspect it was, so thank you again. I've been speaking with Varujan Avedikian, who is a managing partner at TKN Partners Legal and Advisory Firm in Yerevan. And we've been speaking about the economic uh, financial monetary impacts on Armenia and not just on Armenia. And this is just one aspect of Ukraine, Armenia and war that we will continue to explore in this mini series of the University of Southern California Institute of Armenian Studies, Unpacking Armenian Studies channel. Thank you for following us. Stay tuned for more episodes and um, share with, with friends. These are questions we should be asking and answers we should all be seeking. And I'm grateful to the scholars, the journalists, and the specialists with whom we've been able to speak about this topic. Continue to follow us. And I'm Salpi Ghazarian. This is the University of Southern California Institute of Armenian Studies. You've been listening to Unpacking Armenian Studies, a podcast series on the Institute of Armenian Studies channel. This episode has been produced by Sadin Habishyan. Music by Josue Gonzalez. For more from the USC Institute of Armenian Studies, go to the Institute's YouTube channel to hear dozens of talks by scholars from all over the world. You can reach the Institute at armenian at usc.edu and follow the Institute on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This podcast has been recorded at the University of Southern California Dornsife College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences. Thank you.